The next generation of smartphones is here. This is the iQ11 powered by the new Qualcomm Snapdragon 8 Gen 2, which does deliver some big improvements over the previous generation of chipset, including now faster storage. So it's got UFS 4.0 spec, which is double the speed of UFS 3.1 that I've seen in my testing. And I'll do a bit of a comparison here to the previous generation with some other previous gen flagships. So with this phone here, the iQ11, we get 120 watt charging, a 5,000 milliamp hour battery, a 50 megapixel main camera with optical image stabilization, eight megapixel ultra wide, which is probably the weakest camera that it does have, and a 13 megapixel camera with a 50 millimeter equivalent two times optical zoom lens. The selfie camera is 16 megapixels and it's a cutout camera. The screen's a flat E6 AMOLED screen with a 144 hertz maximum refresh rate, 6.78 inches. My version here that IQ sent out to me does have a massive 16 gigabytes of RAM and 256 gigabytes of that UFS 4.0 storage. Now, just what is included in the box? Well, we've got a 120 watt power supply. Now it is a type C power supply. So the cable is type C to type C. And they even do include a 3.5 millimeter to type C adapter. So yes, it does not have a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. We get a quick start guide and another little bit of paperwork. And also this TPU case here, which is a clear one. Hopefully it won't turn yellow like they often do. Then there is this card inside there. So the M Motorsport themed model I've got here of the iQ11. It's because they are a premium partner of theirs. So M Motorsport from BMW. And you've got this card here with one of the cars that has the iQ sponsorship on it, Monster inside, which uh, does look really good. And then there is, of course, a SIM tray tool. The version I have here is the Legend model. So this has the vegan leather on the back, white. It is slightly lighter, so it's 205 grams versus the Alpha version, which is 208 grams. Now it is curved the edges here, so in hand, holding it feels very nice. Got easy access to those power buttons, the volume button on the right hand side here, which are made out of metal. So metal frame around the outside of it. It feels premium, looks really good. And because of the vegan leather, it's a, a bit lighter as mentioned, but it also gives it a bit of grip and texture to it. I just worry about this white here, eventually maybe showing a little bit of dirt, having this in your pocket wearing up against them. Because in the past with other vegan leather and phones that I've had, they tend to show a bit of wear a lot quicker. Of course, it's gonna wear out faster than say, well, glass on the rear wood there. But it's overall so far holding up well, but I've only had it in my pocket for just about a week. Uh, that's all there. So with our cameras, we've got a main 50 megapixel camera, which is the GN5 optically image stabilized camera to the lens of it with electronic image stabilization, eight megapixel ultra wide and a 13 megapixel telephoto. So this camera here is for portraits and just any kind of zoom shot there. So it's a 50 millimeter equivalent with it. And we have uh, down here, laser focus infrared there to aid it. This is a little bit of metal here, glass on the back, dual tone LED flash. And then if you look here down the bottom, we do have our type C port. Now this is USB 3.2. It does not seem to have USB 3.1, sorry. Does not seem to have video out. And we've got a SIM tray that supports two nano SIMs. So no micro SD card support, no 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. Dual speakers, so one here at the bottom. And then right up the top, we have an IR transmitter secondary mic. And in the earpiece here is our secondary loudspeaker. You can see the antenna lines. So easy access to the power button, however, not so easy access to the in-screen fingerprint reader, which is for me a little bit low. I would have preferred it to be about there because that's just a lot easier. Tap the power button, you'd scan your finger there, but you know you need to move your thumb right down and then you can unlock that. And our screen here, very nice. This is a flat AMOLED, so it is a E6 AMOLED. And we're looking at a 1440p resolution with this. So it's QHD+, plus, can peak at 1800 nits and the bezels they look pretty good but for me it's the best part of this phone is the screen it's a stunning display and i love how it is flat amoled of course so you get those deep blacks and we have a camera in the front here this one is a 16 megapixel 
selfie cam that sports 1080p video that doesn't have electronic image stabilization, sadly. The screen they're using is a very nice flat AMOLED, as I mentioned before. So 1440p resolution, it's very sharp. It's a clear screen, bright screen, and being flat, there's no distortion in the colors on the edges that you would have with curved AMOLED screens. Bezels look pretty good. And I'll just show you some sample images that it's a typical AMOLED panel here that it looks really nice. So we've got those deep blacks, good contrast, saturation, very punchy looking images, depending on how you set it, of course, with the settings, which I'll show you shortly. But I just wanted to point out too that you shouldn't see any flicker. Although there is no DC dimming option I see in the settings, it does seem that IQ, they're using a pulse width modulation frequency high enough that I can't in person see any flicker with the screen at all. But you can see a little bit of banding. It's probably more obvious with this blue image right now. You can see now, look at that banding. And indirect sunlight, how does it fare? Well, because it's got that peak brightness of 1800 nits, it is very good indirect sunlight. You can make it out, see it perfectly fine. Now there's a bit of banding happening now you can see going up and down the screen and that's to do with the shutter rate of the camera I used to capture this outdoor shot. But again, you won't see that actually in person. Now the settings, the options we do have, I'll just quickly go into those for our display. So there is uh, a few in there that are quite handy, of course. So one of them is the resolution. I think most people would probably just leave it on, the default is actually the 1080p, which at normal viewing distances, you can't really tell that much of a difference between 1440p and 1080p on a 6.78 inch screen that we do have. But when you look at it closer, you notice that, oh yes, it does look quite a bit sharper. But when you're at the normal kind of viewing distance, like about, I don't know, uh, what is it? 30, 40 centimeters away from looking at your mobile screen is when you don't really see it too much there. Now refresh rate, you can force that onto high, which I've done, which is 144 Hertz. And it is very, very quick. Then you've got the standard at 60 for battery saving and smart switch there, which is gonna be switching that according to the content to help save on battery. Now the touch response, gestures and everything are working really well with the screen and I haven't experienced any issues and the UI and everything right here, very quick. So the skin it is running on top of Android 12 here is their Fun Touch OS and the performance of it, very good. So I've had no problems I've had no lag that I've experienced and you wouldn't expect it either with this kind of spec. So we're on the latest and greatest now, the Snapdragon 8 Gen 2. So before we had the 8 Plus Gen 1 and now this is an increase in the GPU performance, which I'll get onto later. My concern with this new chipset is, is thermals. How will it handle the heat? We've got a vapor chamber. Will it throttle? Uh, that's all gonna be hopefully answered in this review here too of it. So my model here's got 16 gigabytes of RAM with the additional 8 which is part of, well, they call it RAM extension here, well, extended, but it really, it's caching, okay? It's just a caching system there. So a virtual disk that's going to help improve that performance. And 256 gigabytes of storage there, which is UFS 4 spec now. So it is very quick. I've experienced no lag at all with the UI here. Uh, we've got all our apps there in an app drawer, and it's a straightforward, fast system there, the UI FunTouch OS, and it is getting better. It's improving. I'll say it's not my favorite UI, but it, it has improved quite a bit, and the performance is just amazing. So the toggles, everything you bring down, uh, there is no noticeable lag at all because you've got it all right there, and the experience is going to be very snappy, very quick, everything's fluid, everything just loads up instantly. Thanks to the chipset and the very fast RAM now, 16 gigabytes is ample, more than people's laptops, most people's laptops anyway, and that very fast storage. Bloatware, well, it doesn't come with really a lot of bloatware. IQ put on their own application. So yes, we've got iQoo.com, Cloud, the App Store, Easy Share, few others, um, their own apps, in-house applications there, Game Center too. So not really bloatware that I would classify as bloat, like things like Booking.com, TikTok, Facebook, not pre-installed, which is good. So they're more lenient when it comes to bloatware compared to other brands, which is excellent. So charge times with the 120 watt charger, as you'd imagine, very quick. So 5,000 milliamp hour, hour battery, it only took 22 minutes to go from 6% to 99%. So that is amazing, really quick, and as fast as the Xiaomi 120 watt charging phones that I also do have with me. So they're just as quick. 
Yes, the charger gets a little warm and the phone when you're charging, but it's not hot. It's not alarmingly hot or anything like that. And of course it's got all the battery management system built in, protection with the charger. So it will all be, should all be safe there. Now, how long will the battery last? Well, I've noticed that if you run 144 Hertz screen refresh rate and you're quite a heavy user and you use the 1440p resolution, I struggle to get six hours of on-screen time or even over that. So at least it charges really quick. Now, if you do run 1080p resolution and you run the smart refresh rate, you should be able to get over seven hours of on-screen time. So the battery life isn't fantastic because it's such a bright screen it is sharper and that high refresh rate really does take a hit on the battery. So we do have a Widevine Level 1 cert here. Amazon Prime Video is not in Full HD, but Netflix is. And we have a refresh rate you can see of actually 90, 120, and then the 144. But the 90 and 120 is all part of that smart refresh rate. It's gonna do its own thing, so we can't unfortunately manually select it. So we've now got UFS 4.0 spec for the internal storage, and that is really quick. So I'll just give you a quick pre preview here compared to uh, UFS 3.1. You can see, look at this. So this is the Oppo Find X5 Pro, and it's over double the performance when it comes to the random reads, the sequential writes, the sequential uh Reads there too, all really, really good. Impressive speeds. And if I just get my Samsung S22 Ultra here, you take a look, you can see that, again, a lot faster. So it's a massive step up in the storage speeds, RAM speeds, GPU, and CPU. It's an all-round uh, very fast phone once you start to use it really, really quick here. So I do have the stress test here for wildlife, which I've run, and you can see performance drops down at almost... 37%, which is quite a lot. I've got the same test. Actually, the same test did not even complete on the Oppo. It crashed and burned is what I like to call it because through an error message that the phone was too hot and it completely just went out. It just closed the app on me completely, which is not good at all, but at least it doesn't happen here. It throttles right down. It's got a vapor chamber. Uh, the S22 Ultra Exynos version here does throttle down almost 30% and you can see, look at the lowest score here, just over 1400 versus the lowest here, just over 2500. So there's a big performance difference there, but yes, it does throttle and it loses uh, quite a bit of performance, unfortunately, due to the heat and the thermal throttling. Now, because this is the first Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 phone that I am reviewing, look at the difference here between the Snapdragon 8 Gen 1 and the Exynos 2200 compared to this now. That's a huge leap in performance. And it's not just the GPU. Although the GPU, the Andrino 740 now that it has, you can see is the biggest step up compared to the old Adreno 730. It's gained quite a bit. But look at the memory. Memory speeds really up there. And also the CPU. The CPU is uh, not a massive jump compared to the Exynos 2200, or this Snapdragon here is underperforming a little bit on the CPU side, Snapdragon 8 Gen 1. But it is all round a massive increase looking at an Tutu benchmark here. This is version 9.4.7, which they all ran when they were cold, of course, to try and cut back on any throttling. The iQ 11 does not have a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. It seems that all flagships just completely drop it nowadays. But of course, you can use an adapter and you do have then 3.5 millimeter audio. How does it sound? Pretty good to my ears. It's not bad, but I will say that it's not the best in terms of quality. I think others do the audio output. Why that is just a little better than IQ does here. So the loudspeakers, we've got a top one here and then down the bottom. They sound reasonably good. You can hear a bit of bass in them. The volume is decent. And before I give you a sample at 100% volume, just wanted to mention voice call quality, it's fine, there is active noise cancellation, and overall sounds pretty much like any other flagship. I've noticed really no real differences there. So here's the sample at 100%. What 
what about gaming performance? So with the 16 gigabytes of RAM that my model's got here, the other has eight, and even the eight gigabytes will be perfectly fine. Gaming performance, even with a title like Genshin Impact, which is super demanding, this is the maximum setting that I've got it set to, which has everything on high and 60 frames per second. It doesn't lag at all. It's only occasionally going into different areas. I've seen it do a little tiny micro pause, a little fraction of a second, where it will just kind of freeze loading in the area. Other than that, the performance is very good here. Now, what about temperatures? After 40 minutes of gaming, I've noticed the back get up to about 38, 37 degrees. It really seems to be quite a cool running chip or cooler this time around than what I'm used to. Now, I feel it getting a little warm, warm to the touch. My ambient temperatures are only 25 degrees. And it's when I was running the Wildlife Extreme Benchmark for 20 minutes, which really pushes uh, those chipsets really hard, especially the GPU, that it was getting quite warm around the frame here. But then that was only up to about 39 degrees. Other phones, previous Gen 1s, will be getting up to 40, 42, and even higher, 45 degrees, really getting quite warm, quite hot. But no, the vapor chamber and the cooling and the chipset itself does seem to run a little bit cooler. But yes, it is throttling like I showed you with those results with uh, 3 Max Extreme Wildlife Extreme test. So we'll throttle a little, but you don't really notice or see anything. The performance has been absolutely flawless here with Genshin Impact on the top settings. Moving over to the cameras now. So the front-facing camera can shoot only 1080p. There's no 4K option. And in typical... IQ, iCool, or Vivo fashion here that it does not have any electronic image stabilization. I don't know why they do this with their front facing cameras. As you can see as I walk, it is shaking around all over the place. So not very good footage, not great quality. If you vlog a lot, this is really not the mobile phone for it with this front facing camera footage. So I hope with a firmware update, they could add 4K and at least give it electronic image stabilization. Let's take a look at the rear cameras now. This is the ultra wide now, so again, we can only shoot 1080p here, like the front facing camera, no 4K with this ultra wide camera. And I do find the ultra wide video, while it does have nice steady electronic image stabilization, is not really good quality. It looks a little bit over processed to me and nothing like the main camera. The main camera can shoot 8K 30. This is a 4K 30 frames per second sample and the optical image stabilization looks to be pretty good. So this sensor they are using is the GN5 F1.88 aperture and you can apply a bit of digital zoom. So that is now two times digital. It doesn't swap over to the two times optical portrait camera with video. It seems to just stick and use this main one. Now I can't pull it all the way back over to the ultra wide because the ultra wide only supports 1080p it doesn't support 4k so that's why I cannot use it here so good stability what I am a little disappointed in is the audio bit rate the quality so it's a 128 kilobits per second the audio and I find it to be a little bit scratchy and I wish they could improve upon this just use a higher bit rate would actually probably sound a little bit better this is now an 8K sample, so we do have 8K 30 frames per second. No longer is it 24, which looked quite choppy. Now it does not have electronic image stabilization, so it will shake around a little bit more. As you can see, as I'm pointing at this boat right here, this ship, should I say, not a boat. Sample now of low light video. This again is 4K 30 frames per second. So of course, doesn't look quite as good as daytime. Nowhere near as good. And the stabilization, you do notice a little bit, but still very steady here, that optical image stabilization combined with electronic. Now some camera samples. So this is first the portrait mode using the portrait camera. And at first glance, it looks good. Stitching looks great. But then when you crop in, you see, oh, hang on, there's quite a bit of noise, some artifacts to this shot. Okay, it wasn't in direct sunlight, so that didn't help. Then the main camera, this is the 50 megapixel sensor, it looks good. I like it a lot better actually than that 13 megapixel 2 times optical. Again, good stitching here, and I rule it's not a bad photo there, the main camera. This is another main camera sample of my cat Vera. I think it looks just fine. I think most people will be happy with that. Another one here too, this is with the sun almost out. It's been really overcast the last few days. Then the ultra wide. Now the ultra wide is disappointing. Like zoom into this and it looks like a budget phone ultra wide, eight megapixels. It's very common sense that we seem to see everywhere. 
This is the main sensor again, and it looks a little too dark there, a little bit too contrasty. Low light performance, decent out of these cameras. Main camera right here, I think it looks good. Here's another sample, but if there is any wind, anything moves around, like look at those leaves, they'll blur a little bit there. Again, the main camera here, not bad at all, low light performance. But then low light with the ultra wide, yeah, not good at all. Most ultra wides are terrible at low light, and this one is no different. And then finally, a portrait shot using the portrait camera, 13 megapixels in low light, doesn't look very great. So wouldn't take any portrait photos in low light, just for daylight really, that 13 megapixel camera. And the only real area of criticism with the cameras from me is the ultra wide camera. It's not a great lens, it's not a great sensor, it's only eight megapixels, and the ultra wide shots around the edges especially tend to look a little washed out, lacking details. Video quality isn't the best or the strength really here of the IQ11. Look at the vlog footage, front facing camera, 1080p only, no electronic image stabilization, and 128 kilobit per second audio is ugh, not that great. It sounds a little bit scratchy. Now we do get 8K video with the main camera and it is 30 frames per second instead of 24. A little bit smoother, but there is no electronic image stabilization with it. So it tends to move about a bit because it only has the optical image stabilization. And there is no 4K video with the ultra wide camera too. That's another disappointing area. So it's the biggest weakness of this phone, the ultra wide camera really for me. So the thermals checked out with gaming with the Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 that surprised me because the previous generations, look at the Snapdragon 8, 8 Plus Gen 1, and then of course the Snapdragon 888 hot chip sets that require quite a bit of cooling. It's either IQ have done their homework with the vapor cooling chamber that's in this, that it, it seems to work out. The chipset is throttling, as I pointed out, with a 3D Mark's Extreme, Wildlife Extreme benchmark. Throttled down over 30% performance, but it still is a lot more powerful than the previous generations, even when it is throttling a lot. So I can't wait to see this chipset in a gaming phone with uh, active cooling, a little fan in there, and then it probably won't throttle at all. But even so, playing all those titles out there, you get amazing performance from it. UI performance, everything's super fast. Super quick and snappy thanks to the new chipset, thanks to the faster storage. But do you notice it over the previous gen? Honestly, you don't really. It's only when you look at synthetic benchmarks you can tell the big difference. But using it, it feels very, very quick, but it doesn't feel that quick that I would say, oh, you need to run out and go and get the Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 over the previous generation because you're not really gonna notice it unless you game a lot with super demanding games then the thermals work out to be a lot better and the performance in general when gaming. Gaming, you do notice it, I'd say a little there. So overall, very good phone. Crazy fast charging rate, only 22 minutes to fully charge it. The battery life is, however, another area that you're gonna have to be careful. So if you run 1440p, Quad HD Plus resolution, and 144 hertz, be prepared to just be careful with just leaving that screen on. Make sure you set a screen off timer to be quite low and control your brightness a little better, better. Otherwise, you might not make it through a full day. For me, I could I struggle to get over six hours running those settings. Now, if you use 1080p and the smart refresh rate, which is gonna be using 60, 90, 120, and 144, I think it's just for the UI, the 144, then you'll be able to make it through a full day. But the battery life is a little bit of a concern here. It's not amazing as you'd expect with that super bright screen and that resolution, but yes, Overall, nice phone here from iQ, and I'm looking forward to seeing newer models from them and more, of course, Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 mobile phones. Thanks a lot for watching this review.